I put them in order of date of uh, scriptures. Those are mine. These are mine. Look at that. Oh, Okay, so uh, we're in we're in Romans and we're taking a look at um, we're going to take a look at the uh, verses I believe today uh, twenty one uh, through twenty three. And uh, let's, so for um, for next week, for those of you who are here and on online, you're doing the, the video uh, portion of this, be looking on Hope For You. I, I got ahead and uh, did next week's um, questions as well. I just didn't get a chance to post them yet to the, to the web. So I'll put those up for you. Go ahead and download those so you have them. Um, and for you folks, that's the questions that you got on the table today. So you have them all. Um, but we're going to take a look. And, and I really, when when I would preach this section, I actually would hold all of these together. I would preach this whole section together. But I think in the Bible study portion of what we're doing, I think we need to take it apart. And though our studies may not go as long, the content and the import of what we look at is so much more significant. We can really digest it a little better. So uh, taking a look at verses 21 to 23, it says, for even though they knew God, uh, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Um, we're going to stop right here, even though some of your Bibles may want you to continue on and read. This is actually a complete thought right here. Um, and it's it's talking about what the unbelievers... Now, I, I want to remind you that uh, Paul's writing to the church at Rome. So he's writing to believers in an incredibly secular and um, sinful, wicked world. And, um, and the church is in Rome, which probably at that point in time is um, just, no, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it. We, we talked about 1 Corinthians, but Rome made kind of, uh, made Corinthians look like um, kindergarten. <laughs> with with how they took sin and exploited people and everything under the sun, it was just to an to a exponential degree. And to some degree, we can see in our society today that we took all of the wickedness of Rome and we have just blown it out of proportion exponentially from Rome. It's it's just crazy. So this has incredible bearing upon us because Paul is writing to them, and like we learned last week there's nobody that has an excuse nobody whatsoever has an excuse before almighty god um for not at the very least recognizing that there's a god who created everything and i have to answer to it so this is his if you will this is his um oh i i said it and my head just went blank uh indictment this is in his indictment of all of humanity. And he begins to break it down. Last week, we took a look at nobody has an excuse for not recognizing that there's a God and that he is their creator. And today, he, he says, this is, this is why. L look at what you've done. And so we, we look at verses 21 to 23. And what's the first thing that um, they have done by ignoring that there is a God? and not recognizing that he is it and we answer to him, what's the first thing that they've done? Is that they made idols. Yeah, they, they, they got rid of him and made their own idols. So it's not that they don't recognize that there has to be a God. They don't want him. They want their own. So what does the word new mean in this verse? Look down at verse 21. <laughs> Or even though they knew God. 
it, they understood who he was. They understood that he was the creator. Okay. They were told. Well, also they understood that there was a God creator. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's the point right now because um, even though God has indicted all of humanity, he hasn't indicted them yet. He hasn't explicitly stated you you didn't know me personally what he's indicting them for right now is that you knew that there had to have been um and so don't get angry with me when i say this there had to there was a god out there man or woman or something greater than yourself and you completely rejected that so is that's that the what, first one. go ahead is that is that because that's how god designed us yeah he made us in his image right and, and what he used as an example in verses 18 to 20 was look at creation. Creation itself, just by its creation, demonstrates and clearly, he says, clearly shows that there had to have been a creator. It didn't just, you know, come up out of some ooze somewhere and you've rejected that creator. Okay, so that new really focuses on that they knew that there was a creator, but they didn't want anything to do with him or her or it. They, they set that creator away. They set it aside and, and rejected it. So in verse 21, does this imply that part of suppression is not even acknowledging God's existence? That's kind of a strange question. I well, they acknowledge his ex existence by ignoring it. Yeah. By not no, wanting it. I don't think so. I would I would suggest that suppression is um not acknowledging he's the creator. Yeah. Right? Because if you look yeah. at verse 21, yeah. even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give yeah. thanks. So part of the suppression is, yeah, there might be a God out there, but I don't recognize him. Yeah. yeah. I don't acknowledge that he is the God. I I like this one over here, or I like that one over there. And in, in, in fact, as we begin to look at verses 21 to 23, in fact, I'm going to make my own. <laughs> right? That just kind of, that kind of baffles me because to want, you don't want God to rule you and be sovereign over you, but you want a God, which is kind of weird. Ah, we're going to get there, but you, you see, you see, basically what God is doing is you're walking right into God's trap. You're walking right into his indictment, right? You're acknowledging everything that he's saying is actually true, but it's not true about me. It's true about everybody else. Your, your reasoning doesn't make sense. But that was our reasoning at one time, wasn't it? So what does Paul mean when he writes that he did um, that they did not honor or give thanks to God? Well, it's just like when he was in the uh, when the Israelites were in the desert and they created the calf. They knew God, but yet they still wanted a symbol to I guess represent, not even represent God, to replace God. Ooh, is call. that blasphemous? Is that blasphemy to, to give that credit to something else? It, the the issue when we look at blasphemy or or what typically they look is to actually um, that you give the power of salvation to something else that saved you. Uh, we see it as the Holy Spirit. He's the one that okay. washes us with, in the regeneration of the word. Um, and that's what scripture is kind of leaning towards. But at the same time, you and I and the world at different times have given credit to something else, hmm. haven't we? Yeah, probably. Have Have any of you gone on a trip and you you prayed and asked God to keep you safe on your journeys, but you've ignored the speed limits and you've ignored... <laughs> I, I refuse to answer that. <laughs> it did. Yeah. I'm the grounds is too close to the truth. 
Okay, so, and, and I, I say that because, yes, we probably are all guilty of that to some degree. And and to, and we, we relate to it enough where we recognize it, but it's not so, it's not so heavy where if I went down the list of the things that we have done, have we, have we really struggled to work extra hours because we know God is there and he's the one that um, provided for us to this point and he's going to make the month stretch and he's going to make sure we have everything. But I'm going to use the God of money, manna, um, and I'm going to work and skip church and skip the things that I already agreed to do in order to make the money to make the mortgage instead of trusting God. Maybe it's not that. Maybe we don't, we say, we start going around God and trying to scheme our way how we're going to do it instead of just saying, I haven't got a clue, Lord. How are you going to do this? Hmm. And, and that's closer to the truth. Okay. So, and, um, you know, Marissa and I have conversations about this, you know, all the time. I mean, it, I don't think there's a couple on the earth that has been married for any period of time that hasn't struggled with this stuff. And, and so it's not that I don't worry about money. It's that I've seen God work too much. And so, but that doesn't rub off on risk, right? Just because I don't, and, and I can't answer, this is how he's going to do it. I just know that if I just put God, if one, I obey God and I do what I'm supposed to do with my money. And number two, even if there's not enough there to make it, it's somehow he moves the dates when things come out so that the money's in the account even if it wasn't enough. Somehow he's moved the dates so that when it comes out, the money's still there. And I, I don't get shortchanged for the next month because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do or we've done that in, in the years. He did it, but not everybody can um, does. I don't wanna say can because we can. It means we have to literally let go of our fear and our worries and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to obey you here, but you, you've got to take that fear and worry away. I, I, I want to have joy and I want to have peace, but I've got fear and I've got worry right now. So you've got to give me the opposite, and then I'm going to obey you. It is. So, you know, you, and you could pick your own. I mean, I just used two examples, but you can pick your own. Hard to do, isn't it? We do. That's like testing God. Yeah, he says to test him in Malachi. He says, Test me in this. Yeah. The only yeah. time he ever says that. <laughs> Take a look at uh, who, who wants Second Kings 17 15. I have that. Okay, Steve. Um, Lynn, could you read Jeremiah 2 5 for me, please? Uh, Lynn, pray. And um, Kenny, could you read Ephesians 4, 17, and I'll tell you when to stop. Ephesians 4, 17, right here. And I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> okay, Steve, whenever you're ready, my friend. And made with their ancestors, and the statues he had warned them to keep, they followed work and themselves became worthless. They around them, although the Lord had ordained them to do. Do not do as they do. Okay, so look at the question. I said, read 2 Kings 17, 15 and define what the futility of the mind refers to. In 2 Kings 17, 15, what did the Israelites do? They wanted to become just like the other nations. Uh, they wanted a king. And they also wanted to be able to uh, worship their idols as opposed to the Lord. Okay. Now, let me, um, let me be very specific here with that one in particular. They were wandering around. Um, they, are, they understand the history because we're in Second Kings now, right? So Samuel has died. David um, is now anointed king. So they anointed, you know, they went through Saul who messed it all up, and now they're getting to David in that area. I'm not saying they are at this point, but the reality is there may have even been somebody where only about two generations removed from when they actually 
stepped into the promised land. So that would be like your great grandparent. So your great grandparents would have um, walked through the desert for 40 years. Right? So have you, when you were growing up, so let me get really very focused in the example. When you grow, when you were growing up, what was the fashion? You know, did you want a particular dress or a pair of pants or was there a letterman? Mini skirts, bell bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> bell bottoms and mini skirts. Yeah, bell bottoms and mini skirts. And boots. Gro growing up for me as well, it was, you know, now nobody cares. You just rip the label off the jeans, right? But it was Levi's or um, and I or or uh, Ry Ryder, I guess it is. Wrangler. Wrangler, thank you. Not not Wrangler. What's the other one? Levi's and the. There were walkers. I remember that. It, it doesn't matter. Anyways, the, the jeans. So if you came in with Sears and Robux, just <laughs> Walmart wasn't around. Neither was Tractor Supply or anything like that, uh, or something of that nature, right? Everybody made fun of you. Now. Now remember, if you bumped into your grandparents, because I could remember having conversations with my grandparents because I would argue with my parents and then have a conversation with my grandfather. He said, what, what does it matter? Glenn? Just literally rip the tag out. Why? Because he grew up in the Depression. And so you got one pair of jeans. And when that one pair of jeans wore out, you put a patch on it. And I, my great grand, his mother was 106, I think, when she passed away. So I remember spending a lot of time with Grandma Grace, and that she'd save tea bags, <laughs> use them four or five times. Okay, so I'm just saying. Okay, I'm saying, go back now and think about what's happening here in Second Kings. They would have known their great grandparents wandered around the wilderness for forty years. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore through. Their food was provided by Almighty God, and they would have passed that on to their grandchildren who are now. And what do they want? They want to be just like the other nations. But they had personal firsthand accounts from their family members who said, God provided for us miraculous ways. You don't want this. This isn't what God wanted us to have when we took the promised land. You don't want that. No, we want it, Grandma and Grandpa. No, that's what I want. That conversation. They're exchanging what they've got personal firsthand account of how God provided for them. No, that's not what I want. This is what I really want. See, if are you seeing what we're talking about here? Beginning to understand yeah. it can be a little bit more. Okay, uh, I asked Lynn Cray to read Jeremiah 2.5. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? So what what have they done? In in Second Kings seventeen fifteen, they not only wanted a king to rule them when they had God to rule them, they want they made idols to represent themselves just like the other nations. Here in Jeremiah two five, now we're way down the track, and they have wandered. It's not that they they are they are so far they've walked away and this in jeremiah 2 5 it was a willful choice all along it was a willful choice but now it's almost that they don't even know how to get back they've walked so far away they don't know how to get back in a willful choice um, and if that's not enough i've, I've asked kenny to read the ephesians 4 17 and, and i'll tell you when to stop kenny <clears throat> This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye no longer walk as the Gentiles also walk in the vanity of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who, being past feeling, gave themselves up to a, <laughs> a sin, Yes, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But ye did not so learn Christ, if so be that ye heard him and were taught in him, even as truth is in Jesus, that ye put away as concerning your former manner of life, the old man that waxes corrupt 
after the lusts of deceit, and that ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay. And put on the new man. That right. After right, God, okay. right there's good. So put on the new man, and it starts with how you think. Notice how they're thinking. Their, their way of thinking is so corrupt that all they can think of is their own selfishness their, and lasciviousness. It has a, a sexual connotation to it, but the reality is their own selfish pleasure. Okay? Um, notice that they're greedy. Mm -hmm. they're, how much is enough? Well, just a little bit more. Right? Just one more dollar, just one more house, one more burger, whatever it is. And that's the way they think. And that's the way they're, they're continuing to think. And guess what? That was the way before Christ transformed us and helped us be able to think completely different. That's the way we, we thought. Because that's what Paul is saying in Ephesians. But that's, the, that's part of the suppression. Right? You can't blame your mom and dad for how you think now. You're making these choices all on your own, and you're on your own outside of their home. They're not in control of you anymore. You're choosing to do it. That's what all, this is. That's what all of this is building towards. The futility of their mind refers to how we have walked away from God and selfishly tried to please ourselves and made and made other gods. We just wouldn't say that anymore. We wouldn't say we're idolaters, but we made our home our idol. We made our family our idol. We made our jobs our idol. We made our spouse our idol. We made our college career our idol. We've made our vacations our idols. We've made our boats our idols. We've made our cars our idols. We've made whatever we wanted our idol. Everything but God. Okay. Sleep. What's that? Sleep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. In, in that you moment, can. I don't care what God wants. This is what I want. That really is the extent of lasciviousness. What does it mean for the heart to be darkened? Harden their heart. Just like they did to uh, the Egypt uh, ruler. Pharaoh. Uh, I would say I mean, become, become uh, stubborn. Yeah, more stubborn. Okay. But remember, there's a there is a word image that he's painting in these words. What were you going to say, Lynn? They're unable to see the truth. Mm. Um, I use this illustration a lot, but do you have a light switch or a light by your bed? Yes. Yes. Do you always, do you, do you always use it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there are you know we know right where the light is but we also know right where the bathroom or whatever else is we still even though we know it's dark we should turn the light on so we can actually make out what's there but we're afraid if we turn the light on, it's really going to wake us up and we're not going to be able to get back to sleep right so we'd rather risk stumbling over stubbing our toe or really hurting ourselves by falling than turning the light on so because we want our sleep right we know we need sleep but that's the kind of the issue of of the darkened heart it's grown if you will it's grown calloused right and and because it's dark and we want what we want we'd rather want what we want than we know is good for us and should even why because it's going to wake us up so that we can see what's going on so we can avoid the things we don't want but in that state, we still choose because we're being motivated by what we want. Is there another verse about our hearts that actually would be very appropriate here? And I use it quite often. I quote it. Jeremiah 17, 9. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And I paraphrase it above all things. You know, how can we really possibly understand how wicked they are? And that's that's the point of what's going on here. So notice, this is verse 21. We And, and if I asked you point blank right now at the beginning of the study, are you an idolater? 
what would you say? No. Am, am no. I an idolater? Well, it depends yes. on your definition. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> only one All right, definition. Clinton. <laughs> it depends on how you want to define certain words, right? The, no. It, right now, though, have we have we worshipped idols based on what we've just talked about, just in verse 21? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, am I an idolater? We haven't been completely given over to it. Mm -hmm. But at any given point in time, we've chosen an idol over Almighty God. And before we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we were an idolater, weren't we? I was. I don't know about, I, I, you know, I'm not going to throw you under the bus. I know I was. So so as, as believers, then, uh, can we actually be idolaters if we actually give the glory to God, give what is righteous to him you know what is uh the, the service right and still uh, a nice um not that you are worshiping but that uh we we have these things so i guess the question is did god provide those nice things for us or are we taking them and turning them into idols that's a that's a great question steve if, um, can if if uh somebody else needed what you had today could you give it away <laughs> not if it's not if it's kenny <laughs> depends on what it is not if it's kenny You'll, you yeah. wouldn't give kenny away <laughs> don't, don't, don't get me wrong we you know do we need our homes to live in? Yes. Yeah. But in a, in a moment's notice, could you inconvenience yourself and take somebody into your home? Yeah. And I'm not saying, and I, now hang on a second, let me finish. I inconvenience would... yourself to the point where I'm going, to, I'm going to have to sleep on the couch. I'm going to give them my bedroom. Sure. Okay. Not, and not for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Indefinitely. Do you want me to be honest? Well, it no, I want to. It depends. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, we just said it depends. What I, what I'm saying is, and and I think we would agree with you, Lynn, to some degree, because if once you if you realize you're being taken advantage of, yeah, yeah you you re, you make new arrangements as you're going along. But what I'm saying is, if you're holding on to things so tightly that your automatic response is no, instead of I, I need to pray about it and ask the Lord, but yeah, I'd be willing to if this was a need. Um, because there are some folks who, no, this is my house. No, this is my car. No, this is my bank account. No, I'm not giving that. I'm going on vacation. And, and if you talk to them over their lifetimes, well, no, I, I'm the one that studied and got the job. Yeah, well, God was part of it, but you know, so the, the issue is where's the arrogance where is the where who who is actually getting the credit for the blessings of your life mm -hmm. that goes to the lord so can you have nice things absolutely god doesn't say having nice things is sin god doesn't say you can't spend money what does he say the love of ah the, the love of money the love of money Loving it so much that you love it more than Jesus. That's an idol. Yeah. Does that make sense now? Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I don't like it any better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I hear you. Uh, so look at verse 22. Look at verse 22 here. It says, professing to be wise, they became fools. He's talking about the unbelievers now. They're the smartest thing since sliced bread. They, they can, um, yeah, I gotta be careful. Um, you know, they're incredibly educated. They have the PhDs. They've, they've got everything under the sun, but the reality is God has no part in their lives whatsoever. Yeah. Um, Norma. Yes. Could I get you to look up Jeremiah 10, 14? Sure. And Lynn Jepson, can I get you to look up 1 Corinthians 1, 20? 
Sure. Jeremiah 4, 13. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 10, 10 14. 10, 10. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. To 14, okay. You got it, Norma? Uh, almost. Okay, it's written. <laughs> I'm having trouble putting it in on the uh, phone. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry, we're old school. We actually are using <laughs> the paper. It was a new phone. Yeah, yeah, I didn't carry my Bible down. I'm really bad. <laughs> it's okay. Don't panic. Here we go. Let's okay, see. she's got it. Okay. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure its, his wrath. Tell them this. These gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heaven. Okay. Hang, hang on one second. Yep. Like mine. Um, in Jeremiah 10, 14, I think you were reading, starting uh, at verse 10. Yep, I'll start again. Okay. Everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. His images are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They uh, are worthless. Yep, keep reading. They are worthless, the objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, for he is the maker of all things, including Israel, the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. Okay. Yeah, so yep, yeah, that, that's perfect. Okay. What, um, what is significant about an idol? Uh, it's by man. It's okay. Not a yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's what I was looking for. I was going to say, take a dollar bill out. And <laughs> is it breathing? Nope. No, you may be breathing on it because I'm scaring <laughs> you to death. You might have to do something with it. But, <laughs> but the, the reality is, no, it's not alive. It has no breath. Yep. And and as Steve said, someone else created it, yep. and not God. You actually. Think about how disrespectful and remember we started, they did not um, honor right. or thank God. Yeah. You took what he created for your blessing, a tree, yeah. you cut it down, and then you shaped it into something other than the God who created it. And, and not only that, you wanted to make it precious. Well, the tree was precious. God created it because it was providing fruit or it was providing shade or it was providing oxygen. It was created for a particular purpose for you and I as a blessing. And you, you took his creation and you made something else with it. That's an abomination. Yeah. Is when you take what God has created for its created purpose in its created order and you twist it and turn it and you make it into something you want it to that is completely opposite of what God designed it for. Well, how can you make a, a pure and perfect God if you yourself aren't pure and perfect? Ah, good question. Who's, whose image is that God then made in? Man. Yeah. Ah. Who's, whose image is what? What made? Oh. What is it? And... Who are you? Who is the man who created that idol and everything made into or, or in the image of? Mm. Right? He's the image of God. The, the man is created in the image of God. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Lynn, you've got 1 Corinthians one twenty. Um. Yep. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So remember what our verse says, verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Yeah. Yeah. 
to reject the God of the universe or an idol that you make that has no breath or life or power in it? Um, you think that's smart? Not much. <laughs> Not much. Not I, I, much. No. I think it's pretty foolish because yeah. I've wasted, I've even wasted resources I could put somewhere else yeah. on something that's never going to protect me or provide me with anything. Does that you see what we're saying? Yeah. And that's what that's what these people yeah. have done by reject rejecting God and suppressing um, the understanding of it. All right, we've got to move along here a little bit. Verse 23, if these men didn't even acknowledge the glory of the incorruptible glory of God, how could they exchange it for something else? They can't. What does that word exchange mean? To trade. Or replace. Replace it. it yeah, it's actually, um, the that word means that you're re replacing it with something else but in this intent you're making it mean something else oh. you're not only creating and replacing your your meaning is something else you're exchanging it um you ever trade money from one country to another yep yeah you get more or less depending on the country you trade with <laughs> yeah oh yeah Okay, so <laughs> all right. So if these men didn't even acknowledge the glory of the incorruptible uh, glory of God, how could they exchange it for something else? They can't. They're being fools. Ah, yeah. they don't even know the worth of what they've traded in. Right. Well, the thing is, they really don't exchange it because they're not. God does not give His glory to anything else. So, I mean, they might think they're exchanging, but really they're, they're empty-handed. They don't have it. But again, again, uh, it's all in the mind, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean, we can create things that um, are very pretty to look at or, or they're very nice to have, but it's depend on what our mind says they are. Ah, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yep, glory is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, we're just going to look at the first two verses. And Jan, would you mind looking up Psalm 106 20? Okay, take a look at Deuteronomy 4 16 to 18. Deuteronomy 4 16 to 18. Lest you act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on, on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, like the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth. And beware lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. See, God has given us all of creation yes. specifically as a blessing for us and for specific purposes. But if you're drawn to worshiping the creation over the creator, we have made, uh, we have made that in title. <laughs> Uh, turn to Psalm 106. Hey, um, Glenn, that's kind of like saying, um, God created all this stuff to serve man, but man has turned it around. He ends up, ends up serving everything else instead of serving God. Well, it, isn't that um, cheap grace? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What God, you know, didn't we do that? We'll get into that in the application, but here's a great opportunity to express it. Isn't that what we do to salvation? Cheap grace. God mm -hmm. saved me from my sin so I can live any way I want. Yeah. Oh, boy. Where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. So I can do anything I want. Grace abounds, right? Mm -hmm. 106.20. 106.20. Um, Thus they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that eats grass. Um, ladies, how do you like exchanging your wonderful figures and images 
for an ox that eats grass. No, 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 no. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. So it's the it's foolishness of mind that they've been getting over to to con try and convince themselves to rationalize to themselves. Hey, this makes perfect sense. This is a good thing to do. Hmm. Hmm. The exchange is part of the foolishness and the hardening of our hearts. Because it's a process of rationalizing and convincing ourselves the sin and the way of thinking that we're participating in right now is better than the glory of Almighty God. And we know that's not true. All right, so here's the applications. Let's talk about these a little bit. Though Paul is specifically addressing unbelievers and their spiraling down of behavior, is there a correlation between our devotion to God versus apathy for God? based upon our honoring and giving thanks of him. I know that's a long-winded question. <laughs> but it boils down to, do you find that in your life, the more you honor God and give him thanks, the closer you are with him, and the less you honor him, and the less you give thanks to him, the farther it seems he is. Yes, true. Notice that's why one of the most basic things of a disciple of Jesus Christ is to worship in a heart of gratitude. So can I can I ask you a question? Go for it. When when was the last time you publicly thanked God? And when you just worshipped on your own, like you turned uh, music on or you were reading and, and worshipped. In front of the people in public versus private. I just I just did it today at the bank. Yeah. Is there a surplus in your account? <laughs> no, she was sending it to me. Yeah. Well, I was waiting for my, my debit card and... It was either going to be in or it wasn't. But um, when the young lady um, handed it to me, I said, well, I said, thank, thank you, Lord. I said, I'm so glad this came in. I said, but I said, you know, God gives and sometimes God doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> and she just laughed. <laughs> but, but stop and think about this for a minute. The more we have gratitude and the more we revere and worship God, the harder it is to see the things of this world, animals, um, buildings, cars, whatever it is, as something that is worthwhile. The more we love God, the less we love this world. Okay. Now, share a time when you thought you knew everything um, that there was to know about God, and, and then he showed you that you didn't know all that you thought you knew about him. You were humble. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's more of a rhetorical question. Yeah. Because for many of us, we don't want to share about that because it will humble us even more, won't it? <laughs> but it goes back to the issue of revering and thanking because yeah. it demonstrates again his amazing grace. When you stop and you think about all that you have been given, all that God has done for you, all that God has been merciful to you, all the compassion he's demonstrated towards you, all the peace that he has given you, and the number of times that we have turned around and trusted something else, even for a moment, should be incredibly humbling to us that the God of the universe loves us and wants a relationship with us. How, how does humility help us to worship and honor and thank God? How does humility help us to worship and thank God? Well, doesn't it put our focus where it belongs, which is on him and not on ourselves? Just really yeah. with know it all. <laughs> yeah, Let's get rid of the know it all. Yeah, the more we worship yeah. God, the more we... The more we realize, what was that, Steve? 
I said, the more we realize uh, that God and the more we do not, we recognize they're not. Okay. And it, it just makes sense to uh, give him the glory. Well, Paul's still addressing those who actually willfully choose to make and worship anything other than the God of the universe, even though they know what they are doing and that they are creating their own God. Um, you don't have to go to Jeremiah 10, 1 to 16, but you can write that reference down to read later. Basically, it is everything that um, Norma began to read. Jeremiah, Jeremiah goes right after Judah and Jerusalem because what they brought in, the Israelites did in that moment was they, they had cut down and they had made lifeless images that they were, to some degree, to some of their, the people were sacrificing their children to. Mm. Lifeless, lifeless things that they themselves took their hands and created and overlaid with gold. They sacrificed their children too. I, I, I asked, does this sound similar? Yeah, this world that we live in. I, I think of folks who are struggling, um, you know, we go directly to abortion. But let me ask you the question about what about those couples or those individuals that refuse to have any children because it's going to take away from their life? I don't want to get married. I'd rather just have separate partners because I really enjoy what I'm doing and I don't want to be tied down. Mm -hmm. What's the foolishness of a man-made God? He has no power. Yeah. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> okay. Why is it? So, now, I want you to think, right? I want you to think about a world that has been trained and caught up and they can't think that it's stupid. In their minds, they can't. They, they're caught in this trap. Yeah. How would you lead somebody out of that trap, right? And, and if, if all we do is say it's stupid, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. How is that helping them see what they're relying on is wrong or it's not going to help them? So, so how is the foolishness of a man-made God, how is that foolish? How would you explain that to somebody who's caught in this world? God made foolish the wisdom of the world. Okay, but how did he do it? Any ideas? You've already shared some. Showing, showing the futility of having um, an idol or a god that is not alive. Okay. Completely powerful. Mm. Yeah, does it breathe? No. So if you were right now, you needed somebody to, to breathe into your lungs. Could... Could that idol breathe into your lungs to give you no. that? No. I, I, if you needed physical help, you know, what power does it have to create the help you need? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose if you pointed out or asked the person, um, that made an idol or was looking like like the idols the buddhists a lot of people have buddhas in their gardens and stuff you know and it's like you realize who made that and if you talk to it and ask for it for anything it's not going to answer you <laughs> you know it's, it has no life it gives me peace does it yeah. well my brother-in-law said uh, that he likes people, buddhism people because it's useful <laughs> Hang on one second. Lynn, you were talking, and Steve, you're next. What, what was that, Lynn? My brother-in-law said he likes Buddhism. Now, he's Catholic, but, I mean, he said he likes Buddhism because it's peaceful. I said, but how peaceful is it knowing that you don't have salvation from Buddha? You have it from Christ. He okay, said we'll come back to that peaceful, in a minute. Right? <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to it. It makes you peaceful in a minute. Um, yeah. Steve, what what were you saying? Uh, I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my friend. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve. 
Well, let's let's just chase that rabbit for a minute down Buddha's uh, quarter. Um, the whole essence of, of Buddhism is to train your mind not to think about the things that bother you. Transcendental meditation. We're going to we're going to literally create a new place where I don't have any problems that I can dwell, um, and that's where I'm going to get my peace. When you come back out of your transcendental meditation and you enter the real world again, what's waiting for you? <laughs> Turmoil. <laughs> But I had peace for for a little while. Yeah. yeah, but it's not lasting peace. Jesus says, "Peace I give to you, not as the world do I give." Right? It's it's God's peace takes us through the fire, takes us through the flood, takes us through the storm. Why? Because His peace. Is, it's not about having an absence of fear or absence of of things that trouble you. It is having me with you so we can tackle those things and put them to rest once and for all so that they never bother you again doesn't doesn't his peace also point towards um eternity i mean there's that hope and that's why things of this world we realize that it's it's on a shelf by itself we realize that this is temporary and there's something much more eternal coming coming to us so that's why we should have peace yeah. Am I saying well, and, that right? <laughs> well, I, I believe you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> innate, innate in God's peace is a hope that even though we're dealing with everything that's troubling in this world, there is a place that we are going to where there will never be this trouble again. Exactly. Amen. And that, that is something that this world cannot give us because it comes in cycles. Just because you overcame it right now doesn't mean you're not going to deal with it tomorrow or in 10 minutes. It can't give you true lasting peace, so therefore there is no true lasting hope. Mm -hmm. What do you depend on instead of God when you begin to worry? Self. Luck. <laughs> No, it's true. It's luck, really. People, it's a, gee, I hope dependent. I'm lucky enough to win the lottery. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> You're depending on anything but God, correct? You're depending yeah, right, on God. right. Actually, man's stuff is what we. Yeah. Is that an idol? Yes. Do you, Do you realize that that's what? What is? When you depend on something other than God. That's my hope. Created an idol like ourselves, yeah, yeah, because we, we well, create the idol to you, mm -hmm. yes. I don't need Why anybody do in this world, I can do it on my own, yep, yep. exactly. You become your own God, yep, yeah, because we create our God in our image, yep. So, where or who? Do you go to first before praying and asking God to help you? Go to God. But banker. Okay, listen to listen to that question again. Where or who do you go to first before praying and asking God to help you? I go to the bathroom. <laughs> I sit in there and I shut the door and then I ask God to help me. I isolate myself. You're making the bathroom your idol, Lynn? <laughs> no place of refuge. You said, where do I go before first before I pray? I go away by myself. Uh, other people. Yeah, Lynn, Lynn's, uh, what she's doing, she's just <laughs> going to a quiet place in order to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, I had kids. If I wanted to find them, I just went to the bathroom. They but you're still it. thinking, you're still doing it yourself. You're saying, I can, I can do it. Oh no! Not trust me. Uh, the the reality is when we go to when we if um I'm going to go I I can get peace if I go take a walk in nature. I can get peace if I um uh, well. Some people listen to music. Yeah, go go to the uh, the concert or put my headphones on and just tune the entire world out. I can. Um, get peace if I drink myself into oblivion or smoke Slander. myself into oblivion or go driving. I'm going to go driving and just drive till 
till um, I'm at peace and I'm okay. Who do we go to? Who's the person you pick up the phone to and call? Hey, can we talk? Or you drive to their house and you begin to talk. Or um, do you, is it Facebook? Is it uh, messaging? You know, you're not getting what you want or you're not getting an answer. So you just, you know, almost like uh, filling a gun with, with uh, pepper spray, uh, if you will, you, you buckshot, you just fire off something to everybody to see if you can get anybody to respond to you. Do, do you realize when we behave this way, when we depend on anything instead of God, or we're, we're going to a place or something, or we're, we're depending on somebody else other than the God we say we have a relationship with, um, in that moment, we are making them and that an idol. Mm -hmm. At what point? At what point do we re, do we use the talents God gave us? Though I mean, I can I yeah I go to God in prayer. I always believe in that. But I mean, sometimes I think, well, God gave me a brain. I should figure this out. That doesn't come into play. Well, I believe the Holy Spirit. Well, the reality is. Um, the Holy Spirit will guide and lead you. You walk in the Spirit. You'll pray in the Spirit. And when you're doing that with the Spirit, the Spirit is leading you. Then that's what you're. Then you're honoring the Lord. You're doing it for Him, not yourself. We're we're not talking about getting up and um, doing so. Yeah, ch changing the tire on your car or different things of that nature. What um, What do you do when your kid walks into your house and and says? Um, my marriage has completely fallen apart. Mm -hmm. So nothing superficial. You think about deeper. Yeah. I, yeah. But that's because even in the superficial everyday life, I'm talking to the Lord in a constant conversation. Like parking spots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like a parking spot. <laughs> um, because sometimes, you know, just, just honor the Lord with your life and he will bless you in so many no. Parking spot. Can you honor and thank God for a parking spot or not? Let's say the parking spot is an extra hundred yards away. You asked him to provide you with a parking spot. He did. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank, you. thank you, Jesus. Yep. So do you see yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Jesus went farther away. Yeah. Do we still thank him? <laughs> the the issue of what we're talking about here really begins with the mind that's why romans chapter 12 says by the renewing the renewing of your mind think differently jesus helps me to think completely differently than the world does and it always starts with who god is in my life and what he's done for me so uh you, you folks can take this and go home and, and uh, or turn me off and turn the recording on do you need to repent and ask God to forgive you of idolatry? Every day. <laughs> I think there are certain, certain areas of our lives that we have to say, yeah. There are certain areas of our lives that we do have to say, yes, Lord, please forgive me. Yeah. Because I'm not fully, completely trusting and depending on you to meet that need. Yeah. And I, I yes. Okay. Sure. So in our marriage with our spouse, right? He, he says, I will meet all of your needs. Philippians chapter four, read that over and over. In my home and my finances, in my relationships with neighbors and, and friends and family and, and coworkers. Why? Because sometimes don't bother me. I'm 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 going to say what's on my mind or do what is in my heart. And we we know that, but we get peace by exploding or by doing or by being passive aggressive or aggressive aggressive. Um, what about um, patience? Patience. You know, that's not a, that's not a gift I've been given yet. <laughs> <laughs> I pray for it. <laughs> Let me let me just finish up this this afternoon with that one. Okay. God already gave you all the patience you need. Right. 
Yeah. Now, and I'm not being sorry. Listen, I drink coffee and out comes sarcasm. It's not a spiritual <laughs> gift. It's a talent. But here I'm not being sarcastic at all. Um, and I realized this a long time ago because I was realizing that my need to express myself with my children or with my wife or with whoever was more important to me than actually exercising the patience God had given me. What I ended up doing was hurting, <laughs> destroying, or um, absolutely maligning my wife, my children, and other people because um, I, I would blow up or I would say what was hurtful or da -da -da, instead of, do, you know, take a step back, use the patience God's given me, um, I don't have to say what's on my mind. I didn't have to give them a piece of my mind, and I didn't have to give them the words I was going to say. Is what I was saying helpful and encouraging mm. and, and blessing in that moment? If it wasn't, then keep my mouth shut. Mom wasn't wrong. If you have got nothing to say nice, don't say anything at all. Um, that's just a <laughs> appropriate paraphrase of let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Yeah. So sarcasm so, is a sin? Yes, oh, stop it. Yeah, you know, it, using it as humor. Yeah, I have to be careful. Very careful. So, okay, I can see that, yeah. So I just challenge us, do we need to go home and repent? And each one of us has a different area, right? Mm, yep. Yeah. Glenn has an area, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't preach this for you all because when we open God's word, it has to read our lives. And as it's reading our lives, I need to, it, it's not there for me just to read it. It's not just a good book. When I'm reading this, it's living and active and it's saying, listen, Glenn, what are the areas you're depending on somebody else or something else besides God? And if that's what you're doing to hope, then you need to come back to God because you're making that your idol. Come on back. Okay. Otherwise, it's a short top skip and a jump uh, to begin to grow cold in that area. And the more it grows cold, the less I want to thank God, the less I want to honor and revere God. It starts really tiny. This is so important that it, it was never some big thing that drew us away from God. It was the little tiny things we never yeah. dealt with that to grow cold. And as they grew cold, they took the fire and the flame of what was hot because we couldn't get them uh, warm again. And so slowly we, we grew more and more cold, more and more callous, and now we just don't care about God. It's not that we, we aren't Christians, right? Mm -hmm. We just don't think the way God wants us to think and do and behave and feel anymore yes. we're cold we call that apathetic may i challenge that you know for some that's um backsliding but there was a backsliding we we just don't realize how wrong it we've bought into the world's way of thinking and we've rationalized why it's okay for us to do it but not somebody else and yet we're guilty of it. Okay. All right, I beat you up enough. Let me close this in a word of prayer today. <laughs> Father God, start with me and forgive me. Lord, this is where our, our study becomes incredibly personal because we have to come to you as individuals. I, I can pray for everybody here, but it becomes hollow and really meaningless because they need to tell you what they need. So this afternoon I pray for myself and I just ask that you, you forgive me for relying on my sarcasm or relying on maybe my past accomplishments instead of walking with you for what you're going to do in the future. Lord, continue to challenge me right here in what I'm relying on as as a God right now, instead of coming to you and accepting uh, 
holding your hand and having to walk by faith. Yes, it's scary, but at the same time, it's exhilarating because you make yourself known in such powerful ways. And so, Lord, don't ever let me become so cold and callous that I forget to grab your hand and walk. Mm -hmm. I pray that same, same thing for everybody in our study today. Thank you that your grace endure forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You're welcome, folks. Um, I will not be, uh, there will not be meeting next week. Okay. There won't be a study next week, but you've got the material. I think I, I will not be available. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Well, let me. Uh, Wow. Why? Wow, why? Wow. There we go. Where are you looking? Hang on. There's a computer. Did you crash? <laughs> <laughs>